Hello, gentlemen. This presentation is on The Old Man and the Sea by Ernest Hemingway. It's a summary of most of the book, and I will also address the main themes in the book. There are other themes. You might have discovered some of your own. And there are some references at the end in case you're interested in finding out more about the history of the book and some of the things described in it. So I'm going to share my screen. All right, so let's get a summary and look at some of the themes. These are the page numbers that are recommended that you follow. You need to have something in that reading journal out of each part of the book. So I just divided the book up. It's about 11 pages. Um, and each 11 pages find another quote in the book that you find interesting. Um, and it is something that you could comment on, whether it's about the character, or it's about a theme, or it shows some figurative language, it shows something about the plot, um, and any of those other elements on that assignment. So here are four themes that I think there is a lot of evidence for in the book. Um, one came right off of the back cover, Courage in the Face of Defeat. How does the old man continue and persevere in the face of defeat? Another theme, this was mainly for me, the, uh, the boy, and also the old man. Have faith in others, or the old man has faith in himself. Another one was luck or chance favors the prepared. And another one is manhood. What is manhood? And what are the obligations and sacrifice that men have to do? So part one and part two, we worked on together. You have notes, your own post-it notes. And we've worked on uh, coming up with the dialectical entry for those two parts already. Part three, Santiago wonders, as he's out there all alone, far out, he rode out much further than he normally does, and he can't even see any of the other fishing boats. He wonders how his eyesight is still good, considering how old he is and how many years he's been squinting at the sun on the ocean. While he's out there in the middle of the ocean, he looks for signs. He wants to see, could there be fish nearby? It could be a big marlin, that's what he's hoping to catch. It could also be some smaller fish that he could use for bait, or he could even eat himself if he needed to. He sees this beautiful bird, it's called a frigate bird, but also in the book they call it the man of war, circling and he knows that kind of bird looks for fish. So he rows over to where that bird is looking, hoping to get lucky. While he's over there, he sees a different kind of man of war. He sees the jellyfish, this is also called a Portuguese man of war jellyfish. They are deadly. They actually can kill a person if you get stung by them. Um, and he hates them and he loves it when he sees turtles eat them. And on page 41, on day 85, there's a tug on his line in the boat. Part four. The fish has bitten his bait. Those sardines must taste really good to that fish. He can't see the fish. It's about 
I, I can't remember now, a mile under the boat maybe, it's really deep, but it is so strong that it actually pulls the boat. It pulls the boat further away from shore. Santiago, the old man, realizes he's caught a really, really big fish. And so he uses all his expertise and carefully manages the line so that he doesn't pull too hard and doesn't rip the bait out of the fish's mouth. But he allows the fish to pull him and keeps on going for hours like that. He, at one point, gets pulled so hard by the fish that he falls forward onto the bow and scratches his face, and his face is bleeding. Another time, he gets pulled again so hard that the rope or the line is a very thick fishing line to catch such a big fish. It's like a rope. It cuts his hand and makes his hand bleed. He is starting, uh, Santiago that is, is starting to get tired, but he manages his pain. He tells himself, I have to be really careful. I can't let my mind wander. I can't think about baseball. I have to just concentrate on bringing this fish in. He is suffering. His left hand cramps up and he can't even use it. So he has to use his back and his right hand to keep the, his hand, uh, the pressure on the line. And finally, the marlin comes out of the water to get some air. And it is so huge. It is the biggest fish in his life. And he's caught some big fish. He promises to say 10 Hail Marys and 10 Our Fathers, and to visit the shrine of the Virgin of Cobre if he gets to catch this fish. He remembers another fierce competition he had when he was a young man. He was a sailor and a fisherman and had sailed around the uh, coasts of Africa and he loved that he loved the incredible nature right on the beach right on the white sands you could see lions coming out and sleeping he went all the way up to Morocco and there he had a competition an arm wrestling competition that was a battle that lasted a whole day and a night and he finally won in the morning with a last surge of energy and brought down the Negro's hand. That's what he calls the African man who he was having the competition with. And it was kind of bittersweet because after that, nobody wanted to arm wrestle him anymore because they thought they'd lose. As he's out there, he catches another fish. He calls it a dolphin in the book, but remember that is the Spanish word. We use a different Spanish word, dorado, which means golden. And it's a tasty fish. And when he cuts it open, there are actually two small flying fish inside it. So catching that one fish, he actually catches three fish. He starts to recognize how magnificent this marlin is that continues to pull him. He has now been with this fish for one whole day and one whole night, another day, and now it's starting to become night. And he's starting to feel bad about killing such an amazing creature. He finally sets up his oars across the boat. He ties them together and leans against them so that they create some drag to try to slow this fish down and also just so that he can sleep. And when he sleeps, he dreams of those lions and they make him happy. And he's awoken in the middle of the night 
by the line burning through his hand. The fish is again leaping through the water, getting air. The old man remains confident, even though he is exhausted. He coaches himself. He tells himself what he must do to maintain control over the fish. Eventually, the fish starts to tire out. Slowly, he applies pressure to the line and pulls the fish in towards his skiff. Circles around the boat a few times. He gets closer and closer to it until he's close enough to drive the harpoon into it. The harpoon goes through its heart. There's a lot of blood. Eventually, the fish dies. Now, he has to do a different kind of work. Tie the fish to the boat. It's too big to fit inside the boat. He's going to tie it to his skiff and sail home with his incredible treasure. That marlin is so huge, it must weigh 1,500 pounds. So finally, by day three, he's sailing back towards shore. He can't see land yet, he's so far out. But he does catch a good breeze. And without him saying this in the text, you know he's proud to show that he's a man and he mastered his fate. And then a shark attacks the fish. It's a mako shark at first. He manages to kill the shark and those are huge sharks. Then he feels so almost sick that his beautiful fish has been damaged. But this is one area where he talks about, we can't let that defeat us. A man is not made for defeat. A man can be destroyed, but not defeated. Then he goes on, then two more sharks come up and he kills them too. And then after a while, uh, something called a shovel-nosed shark comes up and eats about a quarter of it. And that night, as he's sailing back, a whole bunch of sharks come until they literally pick the, the marlin clean of everything but its skeleton. So he looks at the bright side. At least it's easier to sail his skiff back when it's not so, so um, heavy with the fish. He pulls into the cove. He goes through his normal fisherman routine. He takes down the mast and the sail. And he can see, still tied to the side of his boat, the outline of this tremendous fish. He just leaves it there, gets out of the boat, walks home with the mast on his shoulder like he always does. He's so exhausted, he falls. He finally gets home, he crawls into bed. And the next day, it's the boy who comes to see him. He wasn't energetic anymore to get up early in the morning before the sun comes up and wake up the boy. But the boy has seen the skeleton of the fish and he is amazed. The boy promises, I am gonna work with you. You are the greatest. I don't care what my parents say. Mm, he lets the old man sleep again. And if you wanna look up some more information about some of the elements in this book, here are some websites. And I'll post this so that you can look at it um, on your own time. So thank you so much for your attention on this. And remember, you're going to be taking just one quote from the book from each of those 10 sections and writing about it in terms of whether it describes a character, a theme, uh, 
uh, kind of figurative language or um, literary device, part of the plot or conflict. And remember there's four kinds, or sorry, five kinds of conflict, man versus man, man versus self, man versus nature, man versus society, and man versus God. And I look forward to seeing what you notice and what you enjoyed about this book. Thanks.